to all our health care workers out there. Thank you. Thank you for your work day after day after day, month after month. Thank you for showing up early on when we didn't have sufficient PPE to protect you. Thank you for showing up even after days where you lose somebody or even multiple people under your care. And recently, thank you for showing up in this surge when I know you have more patience than ever and when your frustration is growing because when you leave that hospital where everybody is wearing their mask, you go back into a community where some people aren't. And we don't deserve you and how special you are. And the time and the effort that you give us, the heartbreak that you have endured. But we need you. We've been counting on you and you have come through for us day after day. For the rest of us, we owe these people more and better than we've been giving them. Right now, we face a shock to our healthcare system where very soon we could have more people that need the help from one of those amazing people that you just watched than there are enough of them to help us. We are in a dangerous escalation of this virus that if we don't stop, even with all of the work that those individuals will put in, they will not be able to save as many of us as if we help them. Day in and day out, they're trying to stabilize people that are suffering. Day in and day out, they're trying to get people off that ventilator and back home. Day in and day out, they're doing what it takes. So day in and day out, we have to, too. Think about their sacrifice every day going into a unit where they could contract this very virus that they see people die from. What about our sacrifice? Over these coming months until we get to a vaccine, are we willing to step up for them and for each other to make sure we can all get through this and get through it together? We are at war. They are on the front lines. Maybe they are the only line, and I will not abandon them. I will stand with them, and I will make the difficult decisions it takes to make sure that our healthcare system can ultimately help everybody who needs it, and that we stop this dangerous exponential growth. This last week, we had our most cases ever, and it wasn't close. For the first time in a week, we had over 20,000 cases. I mean, it was 3,000 plus cases more than the previous week. Do you remember how shocking it was when we had 3,000 cases in a single week? You know, it took us from March the 6th through July the 19th to have a week with 3,000 cases total. This is exponential spread. It will, it will, and it is overwhelming us. And it's why we must take action. Just look at this graph and how steep the line is going up. What do you think this next week is? What do you think the week after that is? When we have the Louisville hospital system pausing elective surgeries right now because it's that bad. We have Pikeville Medical Center and we have King's Daughter when we have uh, Bowling Green hospital system telling you that they are already struggling. St. East in Northern Kentucky talking about the same and their concern. What happens if we double in two weeks on a system that is already facing these problems? The answer is not only more people die, but more people die than they have to. That's how this virus works. We saw it in New York. We saw it in Florida. We saw it in Texas. We saw it in Arizona. And I don't want to see it in Kentucky. So this is our job. And every day that we spend arguing with each other is a day that we are not putting all of our efforts towards stopping this virus. Now, some of us can ignore it, but it's not going to ignore us. So we need everybody's help because the, the challenge and the threat is so real. 
Cases aren't just going up. Our inpatient census, these are people uh, needing hospitalization, uh, going up, up, and up. And you know what? There is a line here where once we cross it, people can't get the necessary care they need. It's the ICU too. It's not just that we have more people who need to go to the hospital. We have more people who are really sick now than ever. And when you look at this, just know these are your fellow Kentuckians. If it's not somebody you know, you're really lucky at the moment and you're really blessed. We're not supposed to take those blessings for granted. And we're supposed to mourn those that have lost and be concerned about those that are struggling. We look at patients on a ventilator and and other times we never saw these numbers going up the way they're going up right now. These are people that we're lucky if we save and take more care from doctors or nurses than any other. So remember, we have more people now than ever because of the number of cases that need help from a doctor or a nurse. But because our number of cases, our community spread, we have fewer doctors and nurses out there because more of them come down with COVID or a quarantine because somebody in their community has tested positive and is a close contact with them. So it's a real simple question for all of us. Are we willing to do what it takes and to sacrifice so that when somebody is in a hospital and really needs help and otherwise might not make it as a doctor, a nurse, and the other help that they need? What we are seeing, what we are concerned about, we're taking action before before we hit the point of no return, because that point is close, folks. We don't take action now. What we're talking about will happen. Taking action before Thanksgiving is critical to make sure the surge that we all expect to see afterwards, to make sure that we're as ready for it as we can. And all over the country, we are seeing our healthcare systems brace and even break. Early on, New York proved what happens when you run out of healthcare capacity with its loss of life, incredible, awful, tragic loss of life early on. And look, New York is already back opening field hospitals. Again, it's hitting everywhere. NPR, this is six days ago, I think. At that time, almost a week ago, talked about over a thousand hospitals in the U.S. being critically short on staff. Exactly what we're talking about, not theoretical, but happening here and happening in real time all across the United States. This virus, in the Kentucky virus, it spreads and it impacts us just like it does all across the U.S. You look at the Mayo Clinic, which we just talked about the other day, having 900 employees that can't come to work because of being positive or being quarantined. They're now putting beds in their parking garage, in their parking garage. Did you ever think in our lifetime that you could potentially be in a hospital bed, in a parking garage, because there's so many people who need help? That's how real this is. And can you imagine their family thinking about them just in that concrete structure, wondering if their neighbors and community, if we'd done more, would that person be getting better treatment? ABC News, same thing. Hospitals nationwide facing a shortage of medical staff. Here's the thing with that. With this not just happening regionally, like we saw in other waves, there's nobody coming to help us. When our Kentucky providers run out, there's no one coming to our aid. We have to protect ourselves, and the threat is so very real. You look at places like New Mexico running out of beds very quickly. Because remember, if we have 3,000 more cases this week than last week and people need a hospital bed for 10 days, 15 days, it adds up incredibly quickly. And then what we see is it can hit areas that don't have as many beds uh, and, and hurt. North Dakota, this is already happening. They're way over capacity. 
But in Oklahoma, they're talking about rural beds uh, having run out. Now we stepped up for rural health care uh, during this pandemic. Uh, expanded Medicaid has helped keep their doors open, so we have more rural options in places like Oklahoma. But still, it means in your community, those beds may run out faster than others, which means more people in your community are going to struggle to get the care that they need. The surge is very real. Today, we have the highest number of cases we've ever had on a Monday. I'm tired of having to report that. I'm tired of watching our people suffer, knowing that every day we have a new record. More people are going to need to go to the hospital, and more people are going to die. I want to thank the vast majority of so many of you that do the right thing every day. And that's people. It's also businesses, even ones right now that are suffering the most. Thank you. Thank you. Just like in that video, we are all having a test of our resolve and of our humanity. Now, I was watching my church service virtually on Sunday, and I was reminded of the parable of the lost sheep and how the shepherd leaves a flock to make sure that he is able to go get and care for that one sheep, that that one is so important. I want people to remember that lesson when they simply say that we ought to give up or, oh, that person who passed away was already old. That person is part of our flock and they matter. Every single person that we lose, whose information I read, matters. We will not sacrifice each other. We will not do it. So we will fight back regardless of the pain. And I will push us to fight back regardless of the ramifications for me. It's just too important. Today, we're reporting 2,135 new cases of COVID-19. Remember, Mondays are always our lowest day. And that's because the labs aren't open, all of them through the weekend. This is our highest Monday by a significant amount. Total cases since the beginning, 160,232. Our positivity rate, 8.97%, down a little bit. 1,573 Kentuckians in the hospital, 391 in the ICU, 203 on a ventilator. New cases by county, Jefferson, 435, Fayette, 260, Madison, 110, Boone and Kenton getting hit so hard. Boone, 85, Kenton, 77, McCracken, 68, Warren, 54, Campbell, 39, Oldham, 38. I think they had 100 plus the other day. It's a big outbreak in Oldham County. Greenup, 32, Jessamine, 30, Davis, 28, Graves, 26, Callaway, 25, Franklin, 24, Whitley, 23. Bullitt, 22, Montgomery, 22, Boyd and Logan and Powell County, 21, Barron, Floyd, and Shelby, 20. You can see the rest on kycovid19.ky.gov. We have highest Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday this week again with what we are going to see happening uh, over Thanksgiving. We're headed to an even darker place than we are right now. That's why we're taking the steps that we're taking to put up a fight against a virus that wants to take those we love. And it's our job to fight for those individuals. Today, we're announcing five new deaths. They include a 73-year-old woman from Fayette County, 73-year-old man from Harlan County, an 88 and an 85-year-old man from McCracken County, and a 77-year-old man from Webster County. Let's remember that those just aren't names and ages. Those are people we care about and love. So today we've got a memorial for Latasha Benton. COVID-19 is stripping us of people we love in our Kentucky communities. One of these people is Latasha Benton of Lexington. This next part's hard. Latasha, 
was only 43 years old. She was a key member of the Lexington communi community, dedicating her life to helping others. From tenants' rights, affordable housing, to criminal justice reform, Latasha was there to do whatever was needed to raise awareness and help those people who needed it most. Latasha was a fighter. Her mother, Stephanie Pace, shared with the New York Times that Latasha was her bionic girl. Latasha had two strokes, two kidney transplants, and two hip replacements. But her mother shared during all that, she never complained. Latasha tested positive for COVID-19 at the end of October. She died November 6th. Latasha left behind her son, Daniel, and her two brothers, Antonio and Robert, and her mother, as well as an entire community of people who loved her. You think about days where people try to argue, can't happen to them, doesn't happen to them. I turned 43 on Sunday, and I have a son and a daughter. Latasha, we are so sorry, and we grieve with your family, and I will wear my mask for you, and I hope everybody else does too. We're continuing to see COVID spread in congregate situations in Kentucky child care facilities, 15 new facilities with at least one positive case, 19 new staff members, 16 new children. We have so much COVID right now, it overwhelms any area and all of our defenses. That's where we are. That's why we're having to take tough steps. Long-term care, active cases. Again, this is, we do more testing in long-term care. It should be almost the safest place to be in this Commonwealth. Three tests a week in many places. PPE, there is so much coronavirus it still makes it through. And think about it, as opposed to other places, people are gonna wear their masks. And it's still, it's still getting in with 138 new residents testing positive, 135 new staff, 37 new deaths of residents, and one new staff member that's passed away. We've also lost two additional inmates in Kentucky. Both were at uh, the Kentucky State Reformatory. I'm now turn it over to Dr. Stack, uh, who's going to talk through um, some modeling, at least from the Louisville region. It shows you if we follow these steps we put into place, we're going to save a lot of lives. And if we don't, more people will die than have to. That's why we're doing what it takes to help each other to make it through this. Steve? Thank you, Governor. Um, I'm going to start out if we can. Uh, let me first talk about contact tracing. The governor wanted me to make some comments about that to try to help explain that a little bit differently or better. And then we'll go to my slides. Uh, contact tracing, when we do this, uh, has a number of purposes. The first part is case investigation, where we identify people who have the disease. We contact them as quickly as we're able to provide them information so they can keep themselves safe and keep others safe by isolating themselves away from others so they don't spread infection. And then we've also in Kentucky put in place other supports so that we can try to assist people if they have um, various other needs, uh, you know, for housing or food or uh, social supports. Now we can't do that all the time, but we have a number of programs we put in place to try to assist with those. And then there's contact tracing. So once we've spoken to the positive patient, we then identify the people they may have exposed to the disease. And we attempt to contact them to notify them of their potential exposure and provide them information about quarantining so that they don't go out to public unknowingly spreading disease if they have uh, the infection but don't have symptoms either yet or ever if they remain asymptomatic. And so the systems in place rely upon the newer system that we built to integrate the state uh, for contact tracing to try to collect the information and support the local health departments so that they could uh, try to support the public in forward in time, minimize the spread of disease throughout the population. We have also um, relied upon a federal information system called NEDS, 
And NEDS is what we use to capture more of the clinical information for people uh, who are infected and to try to identify clusters um, as we're able to. Uh, clusters are places where people spread infection in a specific location. Um, the focus, though, has been on trying to help people who are infected and prevent more people from becoming infected. Um, and, and that's the primary focus of the information systems we use. Uh, if I could have my slide deck now, please, so I can talk about the measures we took last week. So uh, this, I'm going to show you two reports uh, here. One, these reports were done uh, by Dr. Syed uh, Karimi, uh, Syed Karimi, uh, who's PhD at University of Louisville. He also works with the Louisville Metro Health Department. And he and his team, he's got a rather large team that I won't read uh, all the names here, have done some really um, interesting research in recent weeks and months, uh, trying to help understand uh, the disease, the impact of our measures on the disease and its spread. Uh, and I think you'll find these uh, uh, useful. So this first study I'm gonna share, uh, which was just completed, uh, last week projects what they estimate the impact would be of the new executive order, the restrictions we had to put in place last week uh, on hospitalizations and deaths in the Louisville region. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. So this is for region three. So in the state, we have divided um, the state into 10 regions for the purpose of hospitals working together to coordinate emergency preparedness and response. And so this is region three uh, of this hospital preparedness program, and it includes the counties you'll see there in region three. And I, I put the names up there at the top. So I think it's 14 counties total. If we could go to the next slide, please. This is just a summary of the measures that were in the executive order that took effect uh, on Friday, November 20th. Additional restrictions in gyms and fitness centers and pools, recreation facilities, also at venues and event spaces, reduction in social gatherings to eight people from a maximum of two households. There were certain restrictions on professional services at 33% capacity. And of course, restaurants and bars with no indoor food uh, or beverage service. Uh, additionally, there were uh, requirements to go to uh, virtual or non-in-person educational instruction for elementary, middle, and high schools uh, as noted there. So this, I have taken a screenshot from their report just to show that these were their interpretations and understandings of the rules uh, that were put in place. If we could go to the next slide. So this is hospitalizations. The red line at the top is if we did nothing. This is what they are projecting would be the number of hospitalizations uh, between uh, the date of the implementation of the order and January 15th. So they estimate in that, count, that cluster of 14 counties, Region 3, that if we had taken no steps, there would be 1,932, I'm sorry, 1,689, I'm reading the wrong line, 1,689 active hospitalizations uh, total. If you go all the way to the bottom there in the green, if we have high compliance with these measures, uh, they estimate that there would only be 107 deaths. That's a profound uh, difference. It's a staggering difference, in fact. If you um, look at even partial compliance, you can see that there are substantial drop-offs in how many people are going to be admitted to the hospital um, I think if you just look at the top pink line right here, uh, you can see that even with low compliance, they say that this would have uh, a reduction in disease transmission of 25% and prevent 355 excess hospitalizations. And I'll show on the next slide, 98 deaths. That's even just with um, uh, mild compliance and just by December, uh, if you stretch that out to January, it prevents over 900 hospitalizations and over 500 deaths by mid-January. So if we could do the next slide, please. So here are the deaths that would be projected. You see the red line going upward very briskly if we took no interventions. Um, and again, if we had complete compliance here by mid-January next year, 
we would prevent almost a thousand additional deaths, almost a thousand people in those 14 counties who would be alive uh, because of these measures if everyone just complied. And even with low compliance, you still see a significant decrease in the number of um, deaths. They say that by mid-January, even with low compliance, you'd have 513 deaths that were prevented. So this is substantial. Um, those measures, if, are, if they're followed, could have a profound impact and could really change the trajectory of this and completely avert the crisis of healthcare staffing and the harm that is caused to other people without COVID who aren't able to get care because COVID fills the hospitals, uh, consumes all the resources, and also causes healthcare workers to go out sick. So if we could do the next slide, please. These same researchers also did a study where they observed in the Louisville area from November 5th through November 11th, mask use. So they actually had folks go into uh, different types of settings and observe how many or how the compliance was with the mask mandate. And their top line conclusions, which I've put there for you, are that uh, compliance is, is much lower than we would have liked to see in a variety of different types of settings in the Louisville area. That it was common, common to see both visitors and staff in public places who were either not wearing masks or if they were wearing masks, were wearing them incorrectly. And that there were other distinctions they noticed. The most typical demographic for non-compliance uh, were men from the ages of 19 to 44. Uh, and then they also say that there are other uh, sub-findings which we won't go into here today. If you can go to the next slide, because this is gonna build up to my final points here for today. So this is where they looked at different types of public areas. That's what PA stands for. And you have large, medium, and small. So I guess you think of large as a, uh, you know, like a large retail space or a large shopping mall or store. And you go down to small would be a tiny little shop or a, or a venue or, or a, you know, public area. And if you look at this, their observations of folks were that the dark red is for people who were not wearing masks, visitors, and the lighter pink is for people who are wearing their masks incorrectly. And you see their observation of incorrect mask use is incredibly high, uh, in large venues as high as 60%. Um, but you also see that when you go from large venues to medium to small, that visitor non-compliance with just not wearing a mask at all goes up substantially all the way up to a third of people not wearing a mask, at least one person not wearing a mask at all in these smaller public areas. And when you look at the similar graph that they produced for staff in those smaller settings, it mirrors that. So folks, for at least three weeks, the governor was asked repeatedly in press conferences, why have we not imposed additional measures? And he said repeatedly that public health experts and his public health team had advised him there were more than enough measures in place. If we just followed the measures already in place, we wouldn't have to take additional steps. And so we waited for three weeks, asking, urging, begging, pleading, trying to persuade with facts and figures uh, and also appeals to people's uh, better angels that we had to pull together. We had to follow the guidance that was in place. We had to follow the mandates that were in place because if we had done that, we could have turned the tide uh, from this problem and been in a very different place. Along those three weeks, we managed to climb to a positivity rate for the tests over 9%. We also managed to, in that same time frame, see an exponential growth in new cases. And we also began having, not just in one place, but we had hospitals in Louisville area, Northern Kentucky, far Eastern Kentucky and Pikeville and other places having to cancel and postpone non-COVID related medical and surgical procedures and care in order to preserve space for COVID patients and to continue operating the hospital as best they were able while their own staff began to get, began to get sick or exposed to the disease. So we didn't take these measures lightly. We were methodical and thoughtful and we attempted to plead for people to comply. And again, I wanna echo what the governor said. 
there are a large number of Kentuckians who are doing the right things. There are a number of Kentuckians, however, who have decided for whatever reasons personally that it is important to them to not wear masks, to not minimize the spread of disease, either because they don't believe it is real or they don't believe it is severe. And the presentation of absolutely unthinkable things like setting up hospital beds in a garage and putting up tents in, uh, you know, in the park in New York again, uh, things that you would have never conceived of ever happening are not persuasive uh, to folks who have chosen not to comply with these measures. And as a result, because we can't stand by idly and let Kentuckians who can't otherwise protect themselves, who are vulnerable, pay with uh, their lives, literally, or with chronic illness and disability uh, for a disease that is spreading so rampantly, the additional measures became necessary. And if we were just to comply fully with the mask mandate, that alone probably would help to contain this virus and get us back to reopening all these different things that are now shuttered. So ultimately, it's the public's choice how we're going to respond. And I think along this journey, I have come to appreciate a little bit more John F. Kennedy's remarks, ask not what you can do for your country, rather ask what you can do for, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Um, folks, we're trying to do all we can to be as targeted, to build in the least restrictive restrictions we can to keep people safe. We're trying to enforce these as best we're able to. But ultimately, that last leg of the leadership journey comes down to your personal choices and your personal leadership in your local communities. This is both elected individuals, uh, your elected officials locally for in various different ways. It's also you. It's also your choices. Uh, if there's non-compliance happening in your decision, whether you'll support the businesses or not support the businesses who aren't complying, or whether you'll have a difficult but courteous, always please be courteous. This is not something for friction and conflict. A discussion with your friends and your family and your neighbors and trying to have um, those moments where people will understand from someone closer to them, someone they love and care about, not someone like me who's far away sitting in the state capitol, that this is really important. This is a defining moment. And we're gonna have a dark winter if we don't pull together. And we want to lift as many of these restrictions as fast as we can, as soon as we can feel more confident that it won't be paid for with large scale loss of human life and harm to other people who need medical and hospital care who don't have COVID. So uh, folks, I'm grateful to you. We have shown in Kentucky that we can control the outcome when we act together, when we act with kindness and concern for each other, we have shown we can make a difference. We have really got to pull together and rally as we enter the winter. And as you look to your Thanksgiving celebration in just a couple or a few days, I again urge you, do not mix with people outside your household. Please do not have gatherings in your home with people you don't live with. It is, it is a, a sure recipe for disaster if people in Kentucky and around the country get together in anything that looks remotely like traditional Thanksgiving, that will turn Thanksgiving into something uh, that is not uh, something for which we'll be very grateful uh, in a very short period after that. Uh, thank you very much and Governor, back to you. Thank you to Dr. Stack for all your work helping us get through this. Uh, we're gonna open it up to questions. We have numerous reporters or journalists and a number of written questions as well. So we'll start with Shelby Smithson from WKYT. Hi, Governor, thank you. Um, we've seen a lot of restaurants utilizing tents outside to kind of offset the loss of the indoor dining. What are your thoughts on that? And any concern um, that when we're seeing the walls added and heating added and everything else that it kind of becomes just as ris risky as indoor? We're reviewing uh, some of these options. There are some that we believe are safe, and then there are some that 
might be trying to, to cut corners. So we're looking to get uh, better guidance out. We want uh, to give every opportunity that is safe for restaurants to do outdoor dining, but we do not want them to create what is basically uh, an, an indoor area where it's just spreading somewhere differently than uh, their, their regular walls. So this is something that we were looking at today. Um, most that did it over the summer and other times did it well, but we gotta make sure, especially as it's getting cold, that it is done right, because the sacrifice we're doing the next three weeks, we want it to work. We don't want it to have to go longer. I don't plan for it to go longer, but it has to work. And if we try to cheat it, which, you know, we saw a lot of bars that were absolutely packed at a time when we had capacity restrictions, a seat rule, a mask rule, um, but just packed and overrun. So again, if we if we don't follow the rules that are in place right now, we don't get the outcome that we want. Uh, Catherine Collins, WLEX. Hi, Governor. Along those same lines, what is your reaction to the restaurants that have said that they will not follow your new restrictions? And has there been any um, action taken against those restaurants to enforce those rules? So um, restrictions during COVID against restaurants was taken all the way up to the Kentucky Supreme Court, who ultimately ruled that it is constitutional and we can put these restrictions in place to save lives during this pandemic. Those that are refusing to follow it are violating the very rule of law that, that helps us have a civilized society here in, in America. Basically what it's saying is I can take a case all the way to the Supreme Court, lose, and if I don't like it, just do what I want anyways. Uh, we believe that there are only at most two uh, restaurants, at least that have been reported that are out there that are uh, still doing this. There have been a couple others that all we've had to do is talk to. Uh, and, and they've done the, the right thing. Um, at least one of the restaurants that's currently open has lost their food permit uh, for violating these rules and is continuing to operate without a food permit uh, either. Obviously, that's a problem. And again, these are tough sacrifices. Um, but, but again, I mean, we're talking about three, four. Think about everybody out there that is, that is doing it right. I mean, I don't think the story is one restaurant that says that the operation of their restaurant is, is, is Liberty and America and rise up online. I think it's every other one doing the right thing, trying to protect us, caring about their clientele, begging you to do takeout, uh, doing everything they can to, to make it through. Uh, just, like, just like back in March and April, so many of them uh, doing the, the right thing, even if they disagree and even if it's hard, um, doing the right thing. All right, uh, Stu Johnson, WEKU. Good afternoon, Governor. Uh, today, officials at Rupp Arena announced plans to reopen for UK basketball games and concerts. Why don't tighter restrictions on gatherings apply to this kind of public venue? And another way, I guess, of asking is how is it safer to attend a UK or UofL or any other college game but not congregate generally? Well, all of our restrictions have been based on where we have seen uh, the spread uh, happening or places that uh, we, we believe uh, are being overwhelmed or will be uh, overwhelmed uh, by what we're seeing coming. Uh, what we have seen from uh, professional or college sports to date has been a level of enforcement that we don't see in congregations generally. Uh, we don't have uh, ushers walking up and down, kicking people out of facilities that aren't wearing masks like we have seen uh, at these events. If at any time the enforcement is not there, uh, then that's something that we have to, to look at. But I believe what we've got is 15% compliance, I mean 15% capacity in a very large building with more people enforcing it than anywhere else in the Commonwealth. But if, if we start seeing any cases happening from it, then, then we'll take action there uh, as well. But, but everybody tries to draw these false equivalencies of, well, why, why restaurants and not Walmart? When was the last time you and 10 people went to Walmart, sat down, took off your mask, and ate and drank for an hour in the middle of Walmart? And wait, I'm from Kentucky. We don't mean the parking lot, but we mean inside Walmart itself. You know, all of these are based on, on, on the best data that we have, on the best recommendations that we have. Now, food and drink, 
uh, can't be served indoor at these places. They'll have to live uh, with those same restrictions uh, as well. Josh James from WUKY. Thank you, Governor. Um, you said no one is, is coming to help if Kentucky healthcare facilities are overwhelmed. Are there any efforts underway by the state or, or is there anything the state can do at this point to attract travel nurses, additional physicians, uh, or will we be in competition basically like we were for PPE during earlier surges? Yeah, we, we'd already be in, in competition. Now, North Dakota, South Dakota, some of the scariest places on earth to be right now. Uh, mortality rate, uh, I think is the, the highest in the world uh, right now, already over capacity, El Paso with refrigeration trucks for the bodies uh, outside of, of the, the morgue, it, it's here. It's not coming, it's here. And it's already hit other places hard enough to where we should know, and we should know better. I mean, how many Floridas, Texas, New Yorks, Louisianas, Arizonas, Mississippis do we do we have to see where Wisconsin, where where they have been overrun for us to say, hey, let's not let that happen uh, here. And what I meant is, no one's coming from out of state to help us. Now we've already uh, called up five um, teams from the National Guard that are helping out at long-term care facilities. We'll look at what we have to do to get uh, other Kentucky practitioners uh, in to help. But remember, once we hit that, once once we hit that need, you know, we're we're in trouble. And in many areas in Kentucky, we're already close. And it's not an if; it's a when it happens unless we take uh, these actions. Joe Sanka from the Courier Journal. Thanks, Governor. Uh, do you have a reaction to the legal challenge of uh, private, uh, certain private school, K through 12 schools uh, to remain open in defiance of your order? And are there any disciplinary measures that the state, that the state could possibly take or is considering taking against uh, those schools? Well, I don't think that, that we're at any disciplinary measure right now because these schools that, that disagree are taking it to court. Uh, instead of doing something else. And, and that's, that's what we do. Um, that's okay. That's, that's how we resolve uh, our disputes uh, in this country. Um, these are just, uh, I believe, not regular private schools, but um, you know, religious-based private schools. And we're not treating any school differently. We're treating them all the same. In other words, we are not discriminating against any form of school uh, we just know that this is absolutely necessary uh, at the moment. Uh, we closed schools to in-person learning as a last result. Our schools everywhere in Kentucky right now are being overwhelmed by this virus. You know, we set up the, the color-coded system where uh, superintendents uh, would, would get to make a call. And we originally said that was under 6% positivity, which at the time seemed really high. We weren't rash when it reached 7% or even 8%. We, we still wanted to allow that fundamental choice if we thought it was safe. And then we reached 9%, exponential growth, 10,000 kids over two weeks being quarantined. It is not safe. And you're asking teachers to go into that environment at a time when their likelihood for COVID, uh, getting COVID is going up and up and up. And virtually all of our school systems had gone virtual before we had to make this decision. And with Thanksgiving coming up being a likely super spreader event, oh, what, what is happening could be magnified all that much more. And when I say our school systems had gone virtual, many of these schools that are even trying to participate in the lawsuit had two. You know, one that's trying to get into the lawsuit, I mean, on November 3rd, sent out an email saying, I realize this is extremely short notice, but I need to update you with late breaking news. We have had a significant spike in secondary COVID positive cases and corresponding quarantines in one of their locations. As a result, this afternoon, the Lexington Fayette County Health Department has recommended that our junior high and high school students not attend in person until after the Thanksgiving holidays. And they made that, that choice of showing that there are spikes and they are impacting even those that are contesting it. We're talking about everybody making the sacrifice of about 21 days where we go virtual to defeat a virus when it's where its growth is is 
exponential. And if we don't stop it from where it is, people will pay uh, with their lives. And as far as the, the CDC, which, which has made comments on schools, if this were New York and we had a 3% positivity rate, we would have never taken this action. No, schools are very safe with a 3% positivity rate, but the CDC in every document talks about how community spread can get so large or, or, the, or the circumstances on the ground can uh, to where it's no longer safe. I remember having a personal conversation with Dr. Burks uh, about having to get community spread under some level of, of control. We're not control, we are the opposite. And if our schools become amplifiers, then how to stop it before it, it kills an unimaginable level of people uh, won't be possible. And I'm a dad. I, I had to tell two kids the same thing. I know that they are better off for their education in in-person class. I know their mental health is better in in-person classes. I've sat holding my kids when they are upset and when they don't understand. But I also know what happens if we don't take the steps that it takes to defeat this virus. All right, um, next is John Boyle from WFPL. Hi, Governor. I wanted to ask you a, about a specific case with a public school. Um, I think it's in Nelson County. They're going to bring in certain grades on a rotating schedule, I think starting next week. And their argument is that this is allowed under the exemption to bring students in for targeted services. So I wanted to get your reaction to that and see if you see that as, a, as breaking your executive order. I want to let the KEA, I mean, the, I want to let the Kentucky Department of Education uh, weigh in on that uh, uh, first. Uh, Commissioner Glass uh, was very supportive of the, uh, of the step uh, that we took. Uh, targeted services aren't an entire grade uh, coming in, but I don't know about their full plan. I don't want to prejudge it before uh, I see it. Hopefully, hopefully that's an overgeneralization and they have uh, some very specific things that they're trying to do for a short period of, of time. And, and that's something that the, the KEA will have to look at. Uh, the, I'm sorry, it, I'm misspeaking. It's the Kentucky Department for Education. And I know people will try to make something out of that. But what I mean is the Kentucky Department of Education has to ultimately sign off uh, on that. Tom Latek, Kentucky Today. Uh, good afternoon, Governor. Uh, we've had another federal prison outbreak, uh, this time in Ashland. I know in Lexington, the uh, federal government wasn't very cooperative, I think, with, with your efforts on that. Uh, are things any better with the Ashland uh, case? Tom, I don't have that information right in front of me. Uh, we, will, we will get you an answer. Uh, you're right, working with the federal government was incredibly difficult in Lexington. We believe we could have gotten to a better outcome. Uh, even the help we tried to provide you know, most of the time uh, was it accepted, and and it was it was it was a really rough outbreak there. Uh, I hope lessons have been learned. And again, we we just we just want to help. Everybody in that facility is a person too, uh, and and we want to help. Melissa Patrick, Kentucky Health News. Hello, Governor. Um, the New York Times is reporting that. The United States has enough ventilators to go around, but not enough specialists to operate them around the clock for extended periods of time. But is this a problem in Kentucky, and is anyone keeping track of those numbers in the state uh, around specialists related to ventilators? Melissa, first, I think you are exactly right. Uh, this is when we talk about running out of staff before we run out of beds. We think it's the same with with ventilators too. Uh, there is a significant stockpile that can be moved around the United States, though, with everybody having this problem at the same time, it is conceivable, uh, though um, it would be tragic if, if we were to, to potentially uh, run out. But I, we're going to run out of specialists for ventilators. We're going to run out of nurses and doctors long before we run out of the bed uh, that they need. We are working with the hospital systems. I'm not sure we have a specific uh, number that we're tracking. But the challenge is, is not just that so many people will need the help, but it's the people that provide the help are testing positive. 
because of the community or are quarantined because of the community. And, and working with ventilators, specialized, more specialized than, than other areas, working in the ICU is too. And so every time that we, we start running out and we have to bring in other people that don't do it on a daily basis, our outcomes aren't going to be as good. And that's the same as bringing other people in to help uh, in the regular hospital as, as well. Um, and my goodness, you, you, you saw the, the video in the beginning. I mean, our, our healthcare workers are worn down. I can't imagine what it feels when they hear people saying it's not real, when they see a, a, a bar full of people, when they see um, spread happening uh, the way that it is. I can't imagine how that feels on them. I can tell you from my perspective, it, it, it hurts to see. And, and again, my hope is with where everything is right now, people take a breath, look around and say, regardless of what I've been doing to date, I'm going to help because we're just talking about months, two incredibly effective viruses. Can we at least do what it takes for the months to get there and not let people's family members get sick and die that we could otherwise protect? James Pilcher from WKRC Local 12. Good afternoon, Governor. Uh, thanks for taking my question. I want to follow up on that capacity issue. And uh, you mentioned St. Elizabeth's in your opening. Do you have any more specificity around that? We've asked them several times. They say they have plenty of space. They have plenty of, they've not indicated to us, at least publicly, that there is an issue here in Northern Kentucky. Are you saying that's different? Uh, St. Elizabeth's is working very hard. Um, they did put out uh, information oh, a little less than a week ago about how quickly their COVID patients were increasing. And if that continued to increase, plus with their concern about what would happen uh, on Thanksgiving, where that would put them. Uh, what they were saying is how quickly any of us around the state can go from uh, having capacity to being uh, right up there at it. Now, the other thing that is important is you've seen how hard Northern Kentucky's getting hit. I mean, almost every Northern Kentucky County is having over 100 cases on, on the days where there's the full reporting and, and the labs have been open the day before. Uh, those are healthcare workers too. And I know uh, in every area that's getting hit hard, uh, that is a, a critical worry. Uh, St. Elizabeth's has been a great partner throughout this. They're helping us with our testing. They have uh, been real uh, leaders. All of our hospital systems, including uh, St. Elizabeth's, I, I can't I can't say enough uh, positive things uh, about them, uh, but also about all the people uh, that they employ uh, that, that go into those doors every day to, to help us out. Piper Hudspeth Blackburn from the Associated Press. Thanks, Governor. Um, given the sharp, oh, sorry, given the persistent rise in cases in the last week and a couple of days before then, um, and also the higher proportion of Kentuckians testing positive in proportion to the amount of tests being administered, how would you characterize the status of the state's contact tracing system um, compared to last week? Um, and is it overwhelmed to the point that it has lost its effectiveness as a way to monitor the spread of the virus? Thank you. Uh, our contact tracing system is overwhelmed, absolutely overwhelmed. You look at 20,000 plus cases last week and um, <laughs> not just getting in touch with those people, but then trying to call all of their close contacts, you know, uh, that's, that's overwhelming. Um, contact tracing is, is meant to stop uh, the spread, but when your spread is, is this much, it's incredibly difficult. But, but no, it, it doesn't eliminate the need because you know you're, you got a couple purposes. The primary purpose is, is to stop the spread. And typically that's done through the contact tracers themselves. You have it, who have you been around? Now that contact tracer is calling that positive individual and coaching them through the steps that they need to take. First of all, to not spread it themselves without the contact tracer talking to the positive individual, they might not get the isolation piece how to deal with their family members, not to go to work, not to spread it through different areas in their, in their community. And then coach them through, you also need to call your employer, people that you've been around uh, the last uh, X number of days. 
there's a second piece too. When the contact tracers call you and you're positive, they talk through what to expect. Uh, they, they put you in a system where you can be checked up on. They, they can ask you about resources that you may need, different help, especially if, if you live alone. And so for that purpose, you know, 20,000 folks last week, some of which are going to have greater needs than others. You know, right now it might be more of a triage because that's where we are. But that's really important to that person uh, who gets the call. And they're also scared. I, anybody who has a positive test is scared, right? I mean, it's, it's not just natural. It, it happens. It, in fact, even when you're quarantined and you're just waiting, because I've been there, you're scared. Um, and having that person, that professional to talk to you about it is, is helpful. John Charlton from WHAS. Hey, Governor, thanks a lot for taking my questions. Um, I just got the recent new numbers on unemployment. It looks like we're still kind of in the 75,000 unresolved claims range. Uh, do you think it's realistic we'll be caught up by the end of the year with EY's help? How many people are actually working on claims at this time? And what would you say to someone like Kimberly Turner who filed in July and is still waiting now 17 weeks later? With the way state is, you know, tackling unresolved claims by month, can she really expect resolution by the end of the year? Oh, we're going to work really hard to get her resolution as soon as as possible. Um, I know that we look at these numbers sometime and we say it was seventy thousand last month and it's seventy thousand this month. Yes, but another month has gone by, where sadly um, other people are are filing. Uh, for unemployment. So so please know that that each month that goes by bring new claims that we're working on. Uh, we look at uh, now going from the oldest claims first, but just looking at a claim doesn't mean we can resolve it. Uh, we have a certain number of claims where we're waiting to get information back from the individual. We have certain claims where we're waiting to get information back from other states. We have certain claims that we can't say yes to because the employer is challenging it. We have certain claims that the federal government says uh, that we can't uh, approve. And throughout this, we still have a 20 plus year old computer system that uh, we are, we're putting, uh, I think four to $6 million in to improve during the pandemic, but we'll certainly be looking in our budget to do the full and, and necessary uh, upgrade. What I can promise is we are gonna work our very hardest uh, each and, and every day. And somebody filing in July uh, that qualifies and not having it right now, it's not okay. It's not okay. The folks in, in UI are working day in and, and day out. And I know that's not going to bring, um, it's not going to help that individual uh, rest any easier. But we want to help and, and we're trying. All right. Uh, I want to thank everybody for, for joining us uh, today. Exponential growth is the thing that we always wanted to avoid and was the real threat when this thing started, and we're there. We are there. We're not going to get to our point of no return, which happened in the Dakotas, before taking action. We are at war. We are. We lost 1,700 plus people. It's our job to fight back. We will not surrender. We will not accept the fatalities. And we will not simply say, those sheep, those individuals in our flock that are struggling aren't worth helping and saving. That parable about the one being so important and us having a duty to help the one, that's part of my faith. That's part of how I'm, I'm taught to live and to lead. And it's time that we, we never say because someone is old or someone's had a pre-existing health condition, we're not going to do what it takes to get them and to bring them back to the fold and to protect them as much as we can. We live and we lead by our values and by our faith, and that's going to get us through this. So we're going to get through this. We're going to get through this together. We're going to be back tomorrow at four, and then um, Wednesday all the way up until the next Monday, we'll be doing releases or videos. Let me close by saying I love Thanksgiving, and I know you do too. Let's make sure that next year we don't look back on Thanksgiving this year, realize we made mistakes and it be marred in our mind and with our family. 
Who's with us next Thanksgiving depends on how we do this Thanksgiving. So let's be grateful for the knowledge we've been given. Let's do the right thing. Thank you.